Welcome to Bible study at St. Paul Lutheran Church and School. This is our Bible study on Revelation, and this is the one on chapter 10. I am your teacher or your host, or whatever we're going to call this, Josh Laborious. And like I said, this is the video on 10. Got to get some shameless plugs out of the way first. Uh, first of which, obviously, Revelation 10 is right about in the middle of Revelation. If this is your first video, what I would encourage you to do is if you go to St. Paul's YouTube page, which is the page that published this video, there's a playlist for Revelation Bible Studies, and it has chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way through 22, plus there's an extra bonus video that kind of goes with some of the content, um, but it's a little bit tangential. So, I would encourage you, if, if you're wanting to get into Revelation, start, and you can walk through all the chapters if you want at your own pace. And I would encourage you just in general, subscribe to St. Paul Lutheran Church and Schools YouTube page. There's a lot of great content. There's this Bible study. There's uh, Foundations in Faith. That's a Bible study with Pastor Andrew. Pastor Steve's Daily Devotions. There are worship services. Um, all sorts of other stuff coming from this page. And going forward, a lot of stuff, even once we gather on campus again, it will be hybrid. So it'll be on campus, but it will also be on the computer. So I would encourage you to click that subscribe button. And that way you have all the content at your fingertips at all times. So, those are my shameless plugs. With that, this is Revelation 10. And uh, as we've been walking through Revelation, we're seeing these recurring patterns of seven. And we're in the midst of one of those patterns of seven. In chapter 9, we saw a lot of that. But before we got to the seventh trumpet, see, in, in chapter 6, we, we go through the sixth Somewhere in chapter 11 is where we step and we see that seventh trumpet that is part of John's vision, his sevenfold vision. Revelation 10 is an intermission, and it's not a particularly long one. But we, what we see here, and what we're about to step into, is John receiving his commissioning. Um, and that is kind of what we have in Revelation 10. So we're going to step into it without further ado. I would encourage you, as I always do, get your Bible, whether it looks like this or it looks like this, um, whatever it takes so you can follow along with us. We're going to start with the first four verses here in Revelation, starting at verse 1, obviously, Revelation 10.1. It says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. So we have here another mighty angel. Now this angel is distinct from the seven mediators, the seven angels who have been uh, communicating this prophetic message. You see, this angel has a different role than them. They are messengers. This angel is more of a commissioner. Only three angels in reality are described as mighty in Revelation. There is the one who introduced the scroll and the victorious lamb. And that was earlier in Revelation. There is this one... And then there is the angel that announces the fall of Babylon later on in the book. And it, it's, it's worth mentioning because this word is typically associated more directly with God. When people use the word mighty in scripture, they're, they're pretty frequently talking about God. So we may say, well, what's so special about these angels? Some have associated with this, this, uh, with Gabriel, um, and saying it's a higher order of angel. It's, it's, and some have said that maybe uh, this is a mighty angel because of the divine-like power that he has as he's carrying out his role, the divine power that he has been gifted. Um, and he's coming from heaven. He's coming from God. So he's obviously very close to the divinity, but we don't want to confuse that here. Angels are not God. Um, so here... He, he's described as wrapped in a cloud, etc., etc. There are four descriptors here um, that I want to get into. First, he's wrapped in a cloud. This is frequently throughout Scripture. This is associated with God being present with his people. You see, when, when Moses talks to God up on the mountaintop, there's a cloud that surrounds the mountaintop in 
in the ancient days with Israel, there's a, they're following a, a pillar of cloud um, during the day and a pillar of fire by now, night. So we have this connection of the, the being wrapped in a cloud, this angel being wrapped in the clouds as God being present with his people. The clouds aren't, aren't bringing him down. He's not like riding the cloud down. This is more like clothing. Um, and that being he is clothed by God, which points to God's authority, not the angels. He is carrying God's authority, but it has been given to him by God. And then it says that he has a rainbow over his head. This is a symbol of God's promises, a visible sign of his covenant of grace, extending all the way back to Noah when he flooded the earth and the earth dried and he promised Noah, he said, every time you see the rainbow in the clouds, remember, I'm not going to flood the earth again. So this is a, a covenant of grace. And it's a reminder of that covenant of grace. And then it says his face was like the sun. This re this suggests a relationship with Christ. Because whenever we see this descriptor in the Bible, it is result of direct contact with God. The, the transfiguration, Moses, when, when people have direct contact with God, their face shines. Only his face, though. So this isn't Jesus. This isn't to be confused with an incarnation of God. Because it is only his face that is shining like this. And then it says he has legs like pillars of fire. Um, connections. This could be the feet of Jesus. The pillar of fire in the desert that I mentioned a little bit ago. In reality, no one else in the Bible is really described like this. And as a result, we don't really have much to connect it to. But there have been suggestions that it's a reminder of victory. So that's what we see here in this angel. And he, he had a little so scroll. This is related to the seven sealed scroll we talked about earlier that contained God's plan for salvation. But it is smaller. This scroll is intended for proclamation. It's part of or representative of the larger scroll. For example, the Bible, it is representative of, it is part of God's word to his people, but it is not everything that God has ever given to his people. Um, it, it's not everything that God has ever worked in the lives of his people. So, it says he set his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land. Uh, that's symbolic of all creation. You have the land and the sea. That's uh, a colorful way of saying everything. This is a colossal angel in size. It could be referring to how big he is or just the importance of his mission. And then it talks about these seven thunders. And the reality is that God here is pretty specific uh, for John to not write down, to not share what they mean. Um so I can't tell you what they mean. But it does, it highlights and it draws attention to what is said. So we have that, I guess. So with that, we're going to step into Revelation 10, verses 5 through 7, just another little chunk. There's not a lot on this. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heaven and what's in it, the earth and what's in it, and the sea and what's in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants the prophets. So he's saying the seventh angel that we're about to hear from is going to fulfill the mystery of God. This is a promise of what's to come. That's about it. Not a lot to go on that. So we're going to step right into these uh, these last four verses, 8 through 11. It says, Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and, and told him to give me the little scroll, and he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will taste, it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but I had eaten it. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about pe many me peoples and nations and languages and kings. So take it and eat it. This is a representation of digestion and internalization of God's word. Um, so a, a discussion that can be had is why would God's word make John's stomach bitter? And there's the, there's the reality that God's word brings us joy, it brings us the gospel, but it also 
it tells us what we ought to be doing. It tells us God's will for his world, and that's a challenge. And also, if we are faithful to God, the world is going to challenge us. We are going to suffer as a result that is promised over and over again in Scripture. So that could be what it means when, you know, it tastes sweet, but then it makes his stomach bitter because there's some suffering associated with faithfully following the Word of God. Um, and there is a connection of this to the proclamation mission of the church in that it is a joy and it is a burden. There is sorrow at our failures that is joy at God's forgiveness. Um, so that's what we have going on there. And then it, it, there's a command here. It says you must again prophesy. This is a call to John. This is not a direct translation for us because there's there's a difference between mission and prophesy. We're all sent out with God's word to share it with people, but prophecy is is much more direct from God. Um, so we're called to share God's message, and there are right ways to do this, and there are wrong ways to do this. Ranting at people on Facebook about this is what God said, and as a result, you should do this, is not the right way to do it. You can very easily, very quickly send the wrong message to people and move them further away from the gospel instead of closer to it. Um, but the reality is when we're sharing God's message, we, we can't forget the bitter or the sweet. We can't forget the law. We can't forget God's will for creation because it is incredible. It is a gift. The law is a gift. And we can't remember the sweet, we, or we can't forget the sweet. We can't forget the gospel, that we are forgiven when we fail at doing what God would have us do. And that, that's where Revelation 10 closes. And like I said, this is a quick little chapter. It's not, not very long. Um, I think this, record, this recording's only been 12 minutes so far. But that is all that there is in Revelation. It's kind of this angel announcing what is coming. It's uh, instruction to go forth with God's word to uh, to commission John to share what he is being what he is seeing here, and that's what we see in Revelation ten. So um, that's all we got. Revelation ten, the one with the intermission. If uh, if this was helpful helpful to you, go ahead and give it a like. Don't forget to subscribe to St. Paul's page. Don't forget to watch the next video, Revelation 11, and you can go ahead and keep going through the series. And uh, with that, brothers and sisters, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.